Hello, my name is Cal Molone from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. Hello, I'm Matt Badalioli. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Also, I'm an anarchist. And today we're bringing to you the news from Underground. This time, doing a review on the Mises Institute because here we have today uh, one of the students there who was there, I guess, for how long? A week now? It's about a week, yeah. And where is uh, Mises Institute mm, located? In Auburn, Alabama. Oh, yeah. down south. Yeah, down south. <laughs> yeah. How big is the uh, campus? Um, you know, it covers about maybe a maybe a small block area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what is the uh, Mises Institute? For those who have never heard of the Mises Institute. Uh, it's just a think tank um, for uh, Austrian economists, um, for libertarian theorists, political theorists, um, to just go and uh, discuss uh, ideas with the other and, and listen to intellectual superiors from the, the fields of study. Um, and really just to just get together so we can, you know, vent all of this out in one week so we can, the rest of the world can put up with us for the rest of the year. It was started in uh, 1982 and uh, they've been doing, you know, sessions uh, online and at the Institute physically every every year since then. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really cool. Really cool. Very nice campus. Very nice people. Really great program. So this is, of course, named after Ludwig von Mises. Right. And uh, could you provide us, I guess, some uh, details of his background? <clears throat> yeah, well, he was born in... Um, he was born in uh, Austria in uh, 1881, which was is a territory that's now would that would now would be in, in Ukraine, um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so he he leaves. He's Jewish, leaves um, uh, Europe because of you know Nazism and stuff in the, in the mid 1900s. Um, and, and the the big deal about this guy is that he was he's credited uh, for in his book his 1922 publication is called Socialism. He's credited for being the person who. Uh, destroyed the ideological foundation for socialism. Um, before it was all, uh, all the arguments against socialism were incentive based. Uh, Mises was the first person to be like, uh, uh, or, or to really popularize the idea at least, uh, to expand on it um, reasonably, to say, well, uh, it doesn't matter how nice you are to people, it doesn't matter, you know, what you do or what you think, but the fact of the matter is if you don't have market prices determined by negotiations consisting between private property owners and you cannot allocate resources properly and therefore a system such as socialism is therefore bound to fail no matter what it's inevitable mm -hmm. uh, he's the first person to really really uh hit that point really hard so that's why he uh he's gotten a bit of more reputation than a lot of other austrians hmm. even though he's, he was third generation so he's, he's got that tomb together the uh, mm -hmm. human action oh uh, god yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that quite a heavy, heavy header, heavy weight header book to kind of go yeah. through. Um, I, I bought a copy when I was at the institute, but yeah. I had to get the I got the pocket edition because the scholar edition would cost too much to ship. <laughs> Excuse me, the hard co hardcover edition. And you'll find a lot of free books at the Mises Institute that they give away for pennies sometimes. <clears throat> a lot of uh, opportunities for sales and uh, discounts there. Uh, so who did you see there at the Mises Institute? Uh, the professors. Um, well, any uh, any favorites? Um, well, yeah, you know, uh, last year I got to, uh, I was I was at the Mises Institute and Dr. Guido Holzman was not there and I was very excited to see him because I heard a lot of great things about him. Uh, real nice guy. <clears throat> um, uh, Dr. Block was there, you know, he gave the closing lecture. And the nature standards like Robert Murphy, um, you got, um, you know, guys like Jeffrey Did you hear him sing? Oh, uh, I did. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did. I uh, went, uh, went to a bar down there and uh, karaoke night he's singing. I heard he has a, a voice of an angel. Uh, I guess there's words um, less descriptive than that. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. Did you uh, jump on the stage with him? No. No. <laughs> Wasn't too uh, drunk enough for that. No, I was not. <laughs> did you see Tom Woods? I did. Yeah? Did you uh, play chess against him? I did not. No. I'm smarter than that. <laughs> yeah, you know when to hold him, know when to fold him. Huh? <laughs> I challenged him to something else. Risk. Yeah, right? there you go. I challenged him like a foot race or something like that. <laughs> did you have any class with uh, Tom Woods? Oh uh, yeah, he gave a couple. He gave the opening lecture first of all, which was pretty awesome. Um, he uh, he gave a few other other uh, lectures. He talked about like what this, the four things the state is not, which is cool because he picks different four things every time. There's a lot of things the state isn't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but he picks uh, four things. I got to interview Tom Woods actually. Um, I not I didn't get that on, on video, but I asked him some questions about minarchy and anarchy. I asked him about voting. I asked him about Ron Paul, um, and I got a lot of really good information about that kind of stuff. Like I was very impressed with the way the interview turned out. Um, also, uh, Judge Napolitano was there too, which is pretty awesome. I had a class with him, what's, a constitutional uh, law class. What's one thing that the state is not? Um, well, it's not a problem solver. <laughs> <laughs> it escalates problems. It creates yeah, problems. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, that's why Mises himself, uh, he, he thought that middle-of-the-road politics were, were, you know, uh, really just temporary. He said that uh, 
what, what inevitably happens is you have a completely free market and then people then it's not absolutely perfect mm -hmm. in every way so people want government regulation to make it perfect but then that government regulation causes more problems and that's blamed on the free market that's still somewhat existent and then they just have more and more government regulation makes things worse and worse and worse to kind of fix the problem yeah. that they created exactly yeah. Yeah. every yeah. reform is another attempt to kind of continue yeah to it's fix like if we were problems. if we were to nationalize the healthcare system right now after obamacare fails you know it's like come on yeah right yeah i think you're learning the lesson the first time around so uh anything you did uh you guess picked up specific anything uh well having gone last year a lot of the lectures were similar but um i was able to i guess uh because i passed my written exam this year uh, i had to do some more in-depth studying because i went and I needed to go through the oral exam um so i, I got a much um b better grasp on austrian capital theory than i had before mm -hmm. uh, i think i can explain the business cycle a little better i've always been pretty decent at that but but i, I definitely think i have a better grasp on it now um <clears throat> Good, we'll I guess do a the, topic on that. Uh, yeah, business cycle. Yeah, yeah, we could we could do a long one on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, you met uh, Thomas uh, De Lorenzo? I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's great. He's probably probably one of my favorite speakers at the place too. He has this very matter of fact, very dismissive attitude when he's talking. So he, he'll say, "Well, you know, people say this such and such, but clearly that's that's complete bullshit." So you know for what? Uh, but. So here, here's what actually happened, and now we're just going to move on because there's nothing else worth addressing. Right. You know? like, <laughs> I love the way he, he, he conducts himself during lectures. Nice, nice. And yeah. so how, how are the other, uh, I guess, uh, academics with you? How were your very experiences? Good. Yeah, Yeah. very good, very good. Um, I got to, I, I was much more vocal this year. I talked to a lot of the professors. I had some, um, I, I got a lot of the questions I wanted to get answered. I, I got those answered. A mm -hmm. um, lot to, to do with banking, a lot to do with, you know, monetary stuff. So... Um, yeah, I'm very satisfied with the experience. Where did you say, like, the demographics from the other students came from? Um, the place, or? Well, yeah, there was a lot of people from, um, from Europe. We had a lot of Europeans, I think some Scandinavians. Um, we had uh, plenty of Americans. I think we said we had 32 states represented. Um, represented. Um, we had people down in South America, um, and even a, a couple of people from, like, the Middle East, too. Hmm. Um, and then I believe there were, there was someone from Singapore, oh, wow. and, you know, so I mean, like, you'll, you'll get a, a lot of variety here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's, uh, what 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 have to do to, I guess, to, to enroll, to go to Mises Institute? What is um, the, uh... Well, it helps if you're a student. Um, it helps if you're a student, it really does. Um, but I guess they open up applications a few months in advance, and you go to the website, and you go all the link, and you just answer the questions, and... And that's not that's that <laughs> yeah yeah do they have uh scholarships or anything like yeah, that? yeah it's not, well if you um yeah if you're if you're going for the program that i went to then you're sponsored you don't have to pay for anything but your travel oh nice yeah. convenient and uh, i guess the last question i have so how was the uh i noticed that you had a, a interesting opportunity to uh -huh. talk to a particular interesting judge mm -hmm. uh judge napolitano yes i did and uh how, how was that how did you oh uh, it was it was uh it was great um now the quality of the video wasn't what I wanted it to be because I really didn't expect to get the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I would have yeah. bought some better stuff. But you know, once I once I realized I did, I was just going to use my phone. You know, because um, that's really cool. But yeah, um, he uh, he uh, he has a, a really just profound knowledge of like legal history. Mm -hmm. So he he can he knows you know like what the law is today and how it got that way and why things are you know. So why don't the police have an obligation to protect you? You know what what um, created that statute? Mm -hmm. um, you know how do we get you know what's the what are the clauses in the constitution that have been the most uh, exploited? Um, what's um, so you know just stuff like just generally stuff like that. You know he's able to ask him about a law and he can tell you the legal standing behind it. You know what the controversies were. Um, so that it was it was great. I got to see his. His, I guess, view of government, his uh, view of the current um, legal system, his view of uh, constitutional history, and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was a great opportunity. I yeah, think, yeah. I, for, for a guy who's on uh, Fox News sometimes and, mm -hmm. uh, and spotting a lot of this information out yeah. there, sometimes I've, I've kind of wasn't sure whether or not he stands on an Amenicus position, but the the interview that you've had with him was very revealing that he views the Constitution as not being a, a, a tangible real contract, right. uh, so to speak. Um, so that's kind of pretty cool. You said you also, uh, Tom Woods also admitted, uh, talked about being an anarchist. Yeah, Tom well. Woods was, uh, yeah, Tom Woods um, blatantly said he's an anarchist. Yes, nice. absolutely. <laughs> um, he says that the reason that um, people might not um, believe he is is um, because he says he doesn't have a lot to contribute to the field of anarchy, so he kind of stays out of talking about yeah, that. he's a historian. Right. Um, so uh, he also, um, there was an interview he did with somebody, I can't remember the name a while ago, but he was playing devil's advocate on his show. And then the guy afterwards was like, um, I think it was Larkin Rose actually, but I don't know, I could be wrong with it. I think it was Larkin Rose. Mm -hmm. um, and then he said, uh, well, you know what, Tom, as far as minarchists go, Woods isn't, you know, but, um, but Woods later would say, well, you know, I would just, I would just, you know, playing devil's advocate with you. I'm not a minarchist. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where he stands on that. Cool. 
Uh, so with that, we're going to uh, close this segment with the news from underground with this review from the Mises Institute. What, what time of year do they do this? Do they do um, it's usually, uh, yeah, yeah, well, they've got the Austrian Economics Research um, Conference, which happens in March. Mm -hmm. um, that's for about half a week. Uh, and then they've got this, which is a week, Mises University, which happens in July, mid-July for a whole week. Mm -hmm. So you recommend this to anyone who's interested in a... Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah you couldn't go wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I would say uh, it's the gold standard of uh, Austrian economics. Nice. Yes. <laughs> nice. Certainly, or the Bitcoin standard, if you want to. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like that. 21st century perspective. So that, we're going to close the segment with the news from Underground, and we're going to cut scene to his interview with Judge Napolitano. So thank you for watching. This is Cal Moline. Matt Badalioli. See you guys at Victory Party. Take good care. Badalioli. I'm from Richard, Virginia. I'm an anarchist. I'm um, going to do an interview with uh, the judge, Judge Napolitano, for our YouTube channel and for our Facebook page. Um, so uh, here at the Ludwig von Mises Institute for about a week, and uh, I was really interested with getting uh, information from you, I guess, your perspective on the, the Constitution as a contract, um, because our view of the Constitution, I'm speaking from the, the point of the group, um, for myself, is, well, that was signed by people, you know, 200 or some years ago, and it has rules and regulations within it. Um, even if it's fairly liberal compared to other contracts uh, or government regulations, but to what extent do you feel like the Constitution can be forced on people who are not who were not there and never gave real formal consent to the document? Well, it's clear that nobody in the living in the United States of America gave formal consent to the document, right? Which means either the Jefferson's idea that the government derives its just powers from the consent of the government uh, is a legal fiction that is an idea. Exists only in literature, but it doesn't exist in reality, or that somehow by our very participation in representative democracy and living, we have consented. Now, my own view, personal view, all, my own personal view, rejects all of this. My own personal view is that the government has no right interfering with the exercise of, uh, of natural rights. But the only interference with the exercise of natural rights that may morally occur without consent of the exercise of those natural rights interferes with somebody else's natural rights. So a bank robber can, for example, escape the clutches of the police saying, I never consented to the police because by his stealing, he's violating the natural rights of the depositors in the bank. Right. From this it follows that the only moral government without consent is one that exists exclusively to enforce natural rights. Okay. That is an ocean away from the government, that is a universe away from the government that we have today, Certainly. to which no one has consented, and which regulates everything under the sun. However, the American public uh, pacifically and placidly uh, consents to the imposition of a draconian uh, government by its uh, refusal to resist or, or reject. That doesn't mean it's moral, it means it's moral, that doesn't mean it's right, but at least as far as the laws are presently concerned, the public generally accepts it as lawful. Right, the, the current the current authoritarian is Correct, the correct, correct. Yeah. current regime, upon regime, upon regime. Right. Um, right. So take like certain laws out of the Constitution, take like, something like Social Security, um, so uh, even if there were people that voted for that and elected representatives for, for that representatives, um, I didn't, but I still have to pay a social security tax under the Constitution, and as the supremacy clause would would bind uh, everybody to it because the very law adopted under it, you know, the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, even though those laws have been adopted under the Constitution, um, the fact that I did not consent to those laws, and really nobody here did, um, is that to you? Do you consider that to be like like wrong and moral? Uh, illegitimate well, in, in my view, a Social Security is not only immoral and unconstitutional, it's immoral because it constitutes theft. Right. It's unconstitutional because it's not authorized by, uh, by the Constitution. It doesn't even make sense economically. Right. It doesn't. The only legitimate argument for Social Security is that it was a, a political excuse to broaden the base of the Democratic Party uh -huh. when FDR uh, was, was in the White House. To make the argument of Social Security even weaker, the two Supreme Court opinions finding it constitutional both said that the Congress that it's not a contract, meaning the Congress is not obliged to, to pay you Social Security even after you have contributed to it, because those monies go into a general fund and Congress can spend those monies however it wants. Most people think 
they have a contract with the government. FDR said the government will receive your money and, quote, hold it, close quote, for you. He actually said, of course, the government doesn't hold anybody's money for it. It takes money in, it spends it, it disperses out only what it feels it has to to prevent an insurrection. Yeah, and uh, I mean, a lot of government laws are like that. They kind of work political moves at a certain time. Um, really, the, the last thing I wanted to get to um, was uh, there's been, uh, I think you'll be able to name the cases better than I can, but uh, a few Supreme Court cases that uh, basically say that unless you're detained in custody of the police, the police do not actually have an obligation, constitutionally speaking, to protect you from certain things. Uh, is that, is that Regrettably, the police have no obligation even to enforce the law. So the police can lawfully look the other way while someone is beating the daylights out of you or robbing a bank. Now, they usually don't because most of them enjoy the act of exercising their authority. And candidly, many of them believe they do it and they're doing the right thing. But regrettably, the law is that the police have no obligation to protect you. So you do not have, under American law, a contract with a local police department that obligates them to enforce the law. They can look the other way for all sorts of reasons. So you can imagine a company like like Netflix or something like, well, yeah, you can pay us every month, but well, if we want to, we'll stream some videos your way or Correct. something like that, which would never really well, last. Netflix would go out of business, but there's no way to put the police out of business as long as there's still the tax collector. Mandatory violent monopoly on law enforcement. Well, absolutely. That's yeah. what government is. Absolutely. Uh, well, that's really all I really wanted to get through, so thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you, Doug.